This 30-year-old woman came to my outpatient department with a grossly abnormal liver function test. She was working as a nurse in the Middle East and her troubles began somewhere in the mid month of December. So it all started off with uh, uneasiness and loss of appetite which then slow and steady progressed to itching all over her body and yellowish discoloration of her eyes and urine thereafter. So she showed a physician in the hospital that she was working at who diagnosed her as acute hepatitis with jaundice. A common panel of tests were conducted to identify the cause of the jaundice and acute hepatitis and the common causes were effectively ruled out. So these include uh, hepatitis A, hepatitis E viruses, other viral hepatitis like Epstein-Barr virus, herpes virus, cytomegalovirus, dengue, other conditions like uh, leptospirosis which are all uh, infectious causes for uh, liver injury. These were all effectively ruled out in this woman. And uh, these doctors were quite baffled because none of the causes that they were trying to identify were not fitting with what the patient was going through and her bilirubin was climbing at a very fast rate. So ultimately they decided that it is time for a liver biopsy because nothing better than asking the liver about what was happening to it. So they did a liver biopsy for her, passed a small needle through the skin into the liver, took a small tissue of the liver and looked under the microscope and the pathologist could not identify anything. There was a lot of things happening inside the liver, a lot of inflammation, a lot of damage, uh, different types of cells harming her liver cells and also the bile duct cells which are known as cholangiocytes and a conclusive uh, cause for all of these findings the pathologist could not give them at the time. So the doctors didn't know what else to do so they put her on a blanket of medications including steroids which effectively reduced her symptoms but without un understanding the true cause for her symptoms and liver disease. So this went on for a while about a few weeks and even though the bilirubin was coming down the liver enzymes SGOT, SGPT that is AST and ALT were remaining quite high. Ultimately, the doctor suggested that she go for some specialized imaging. So they even did a PET scan, which is a very highly specialized uh, imaging test to look for any other features. For example, there are these cancers that can affect the liver uh, and they are actually not liver disease per se, but another reason which affects the liver secondarily. So various types of cancers they wanted to rule out, but these cancer cells were not evident on the liver biopsy. But even then, uh, they did not know what to do, so they subjected her to multiple scans, including a PET scan, which also came back negative without any contributory findings. So ultimately, she said that she wanted to come back home. To She stayed in Kerala uh, and uh, wanted to meet a hepatologist regarding further course of action, and that is how she came to me. So in, in the history, the trigger for this hepatitis was not identifiable. You know, in the clinical history, it was absolutely not identifiable. She, she was working as a nurse uh, in that hospital for more than two years. She has had no contact with any person who has been having liver disease or any other infectious diseases. She was unmarried. She did not have any sexual encounters. And also she did not consume any specific medications in the previous three to six months. She had no diseases per se. She was not consuming alcohol. She was not a diabetic. She was not obese. She had no thyroid diseases, no other autoimmune diseases per se. But ultimately, when none of these common causes were identifiable, the doctors there actually did a liver biopsy. But even that came back as non-contributory. Now, I asked her specifically for complement and alternative medicine because herbal medications, complementary medications, a lot of dietary supplements which contain green tea extracts, turmeric or ashwagandha, or uh, Garcinia Cambogia, which is another appetite enhancing agents, which are herbal in nature. I mean, none of these uh, featured in the history. But then I looked at these investigations and I saw that, you know, her blood counts were perfectly normal. Her hemoglobin, platelet count, all of these were perfectly fine. Her liver function tests were grossly abnormal. Her The, the time when she was seeing me uh, in the OPD, uh, she was already on multiple medications, including low dose of steroids for her symptoms. Even then, the liver function tests were highly elevated. You know, the SGOT, SGPT was in... 500, 600s and her bilirubin was hovering around 15, 16. Clinically, she was quite stable because it was not like she was having a liver failure. Uh, she was not critically ill and not getting critically ill, but this disease was hounding her. So we went back again in the clinical history, asked her to remember anything that she has done differently in her diet or something, even a single medication that she had taken, which could actually impact uh, her liver uh, that we could identify. There are these medications that can harm the liver in a dose independent manner. So we have liver injury where we can have medications which harm the liver because you have taken beyond a particular dose, for example, paracetamol. It can harm the liver in very high doses, but there are these medications which can harm the liver 
even if you take a single drug so that those are known as dose independent drug induced liver injury or you can you call it as idiosyncratic liver injuries where a single dose or a few doses over a few days can actually harm the liver immensely but drug history dietary supplement history common alternative medicine history all of these when i get in her so we kept asking her about travel uh, whether she had been to any other place other than the hospital any place of interest for us because there are these uh, rare tropical infections that could harm Uh, involved the liver for example there is this infection known as uh, rickets cell fever which is caused by microbes after tick bites and these can actually harm the liver also in the process but then her clinical picture did not quite correlate with tick bite fevers and she had no travel history but then she showed me her other reports which they had done and the liver biopsy very specifically was it's quite it was quite interesting because when you look at the liver biopsy you look at various types of inflammation So there are these cells which can cause different types of inflammation in the liver. So if you want to look at an autoimmune hepatitis or immune mediated inflammation in the liver, lymphoplasma cytic cells are the ones that cause it. So that is how you identify this as autoimmune hepatitis. So there is more of lymphocytes and plasma cells which are specific cells inflammatory cells that can affect the liver and cause immune mediated damage. But her liver biopsy did not have lymphocytes or plasma cells. They mostly had a mixture of all types of cells. So you had lymphocytes, you had a few plasma cells, you had other cells known as neutrophils, you had other cells known as eosinophils. So eosinophils are classically seen in parasitic diseases or drug-induced liver injury. Neutrophils are classically seen in viral hepatitis. It can be seen in uh, bacterial infections. It can be seen in uh, infections to do with the uh, bile ducts known as cholangitis. It can be seen in a lot of different types of insults to the liver and uh, all of these were present in her liver biopsy but then some of the liver injury patterns were also closely associated with uh, autoimmune type of liver injury even though the cells were not consistent so she had something known as necrosis where large parts of liver cells get wiped off because of the inflammation it can be spotty necrosis where a small area is affected or it can be submassive necrosis where large areas are taken off so she did not have submassive necrosis she had focal or spotty areas of necrosis and then she had these different types of cells harming her liver not just the liver cells but also the bile duct cells which is which are cholangiocytes and this was a very variety of things happening in the liver and that is why the pathologist could not identify this but even then some of these parameters were towards autoimmune liver injury some of these parameters were towards an infectious cause of liver injury some of these parameters were related to you know drug induced liver injury so ultimately Uh, we decided that we need to revisit the history so i mean ultimately when your investigations are blocked against a wall and you you can't go any further beyond that the only way to identify causes for liver damage is to keep asking the patients because a good patient communication and a good and in depth uh, clinical history is what will help you diagnose because ultimately the patient is who will give you the diagnosis at the end and you just have to confirm it with a test you don't directly do test and then go back and confirm it but this is what is happening here because she was already fully worked up and investigated elsewhere very in- interestingly she tells me something so this happened in the mid month of december but until the end of november she had this issue of not able to smell anything so this is known as anosmia where suddenly you lose your ability to smell things around you your food does not taste any better uh, it's like chewing on paper and uh, she went through this for about 2 months and slow and steady the smell returned during the first week of december only and from the second week of december onwards and third week onwards she started developing all of these problems so this was very classical of a particular viral fever or viral infection which i'm sure everybody knows it's covid we have all forgotten about covid but the microorganism is still all around us it's now part of everything that is around us and uh, it has changed a lot it is affecting people much much differently than it used to affect in the first wave so in the first wave it was mostly people dying of pneumonia in the second wave was pneumonia multiple organ failure in the third wave was again affecting the upper respiratory tract and causing a lot of problems to other organ systems so when we checked her covid antibody levels when she was here in uh, in our outpatient it was quite high so this was very interesting because very high covid antibody levels i mean usually after a covid infections one once the patient starts improving or completely convalescing from the infection the antibody level should at some point drop but hers was very high and uh, this was very classically related to the liver injury that developed later on so there is a condition known as transient immune mediated liver injury because of covid 
So COVID can affect the liver. The novel coronavirus can affect the liver in many ways. So one is that it can just cause abnormal liver tests, you know, transient elevations in your liver enzymes, and then it settles as the infection passes off. It can also cause severe liver injury, and that is mostly part of multiple organ failure in severe COVID. Liver function tests can get abnormal during the treatment for COVID because there are a lot of medications, painkillers, antibiotics, which were used during COVID time, which harm the liver instead of actually COVID causing harm. So treatments during COVID can also cause abnormal liver function tests and hepatitis. And most importantly, as the COVID wanes off, the infection goes off. The development of these COVID antibodies. So your body creates antibodies to fight COVID, the coronavirus. In the process, there are various other antibodies that form against tissues and organs in our own body. So this is part of the immune-mediated defense that our body mounts against COVID. But in the process, they, it also develops autoantibodies which harm different organ systems uh, in our body. So COVID mimics or the COVID proteins mimic certain proteins that are present in the body. For example, very commonly the proteins present in the liver cell. And the body also mounts a defense against those proteins, which eventually not just attack the virus, but also the organ also. So in this case, the liver. So these transient immune mediated activity or immune mediated damage happens during COVID infection and during the uh, phasing out of COVID infection in very rarely in certain people, which leads to COVID related hepatitis. So this can happen during COVID and it can happen after resolution of the COVID infection also. In her, the COVID antibodies were quite high. And we also looked at a complete antibody panel, an autoantibody panel test in the blood and which showed that very strange antibodies which we do not classically see in autoimmune hepatitis was positive in her. For example, there was this antibody known as anti-Rho antibody and another antibody known as anti-DFS70 antibody. So these are not classical antibodies that you expect in autoimmune hepatitis where you expect anti-nuclear antibodies anti-LKM1 antibody, anti-smooth muscle cell antibody. These antibodies that we found out were possibly due to the immune effects of COVID in the body. And not just the antibodies, but the immune mediated damage to the liver was what was causing active hepatitis in her. So ultimately she was diagnosed with post-COVID immune mediated hepatitis. And rightfully so, she was on the medication for the same, that was steroids, but it was very low dose. That was why it was not helping her improve. So we increased the steroid dose as per her body weight. So it is about one milligram per kilogram per day. So she was about, about 48 kilograms. So we put her on about 50 milligrams of steroids per day. And within three to four days, her liver function tests started to drastically improve. Her bilirubin started to drastically come down. Now we would treat her for about three to six months because COVID hepatitis is self-limiting. Immune-mediated injury goes away in its own time, but then we don't withdraw the drugs, immunosuppressions quite quickly. We slow and steady taper it off. So about three to six months, she'll be on these medications. And after six months, we would stop it and see if there is any recurrence. So if there is no recurrence, it was definitely COVID-related immune-mediated hepatitis that went away with short course of treatment and resolution of the COVID infection. So please remember that even though we have forgotten about COVID, it was about six years ago that COVID first uh, came into our lives. I feel that, you know, it was just a couple of years ago. We should realize that, and I think doctors should also realize that COVID is still around us and uh, doing things differently than it was doing before. And COVID is not just associated with the respiratory system. It can affect all our body systems. There has been studies to show that COVID even affects the brain in the long term. That is the spike protein impacts the brain functions and also extensively the whole nervous system in our body, including the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. And it can affect a lot of neurological functions in the body. And all of this becomes part of long COVID. COVID vaccination helps prevent this. COVID infection increases the risk of these kind of complications, including complications in the liver. She was not vaccinated for COVID and she had repeatedly gotten COVID also in the, in the past. So she had, this is probably her fourth infection uh, with COVID and this time she presented with only anosmia, which is loss of smell and uh, no fever, no chest symptoms, no sore throat, nothing. And uh, this was how COVID presented in her and this was how eventually the liver also was impacted by COVID. So please remember that post-COVID related organ injury is real. It can present variably. In this case, it presented as a post-COVID hepatitis, immune-immediate hepatitis, which threw doctors off their line of investigation and they did not know what was happening to her. It can also cause something known as multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children and adults where multiple organs are affected together 
uh, concomitantly, which can lead to a lot of severe inflammatory responses leading to organ failures also. And this commonly affects children, but has been seen in adults. It can happen in single organ systems and also multiple organ systems. So please remember that if you have a patient with multiple inflammatory or an inflammatory organ damage where you cannot identify a common cause, please remember COVID still exists and that uh, we need to look into COVID-related immune-mediated organ injury, especially in the liver. This patient is doing fine now. Uh, she'll stay back for a few months until her uh, symptoms are completely resolved and uh, we put her on a maintenance dose of these medications with which she can go back and start her work in the UAE. So I hope you have learned something new today and uh, about how COVID can impact us beyond the lungs and the respiratory system. And uh, we should always be aware that these infections still are with us, among us, and we should not miss it. Even if doctors miss it, patients can also remember some of these symptoms, uh, you know, unusual symptoms that they've had prior to development of a liver disease, which can help doctors identify the true cause of the liver disease. So until next time, with a new and interesting case, signing off, take care and good luck.